So welcome everyone. My name is Molly Kaufman and I am dialing in uh, to this class today from Tuscany where I have lived for the last eight years. And as many of you I'm sure can hear, my accent is not Italian, even though I speak Italian. I was born in the United States and my whole life has really been about exploration of cultures and traveling and so of course I ended up in a in a place a little bit far from home at least currently and I have been um, on the path of yoga since I was 18 years old and I suppose it's not nice for a lady to tell her age but since we're in the modern days that's about 30 years for me of um, being engaged in the investigation of, of yoga and I've been teaching for about 15 now and today's subject, the koshas, is actually one of my favorite subjects because I feel like, especially now, in the day and age we are in, um, there is sort of a collision between the really classical practices and what we're seeing and what we're exposed to in the modern world. And I feel like in some way, this idea of the koshas really helps us to come home to to what the essence of yoga really is without necessarily negating how we are receiving it and how we're practicing it in the modern day. So that's a little segue, but I will tell you because um, first of all, I wanna thank Julia for putting together this really beautiful online academy. I think it's a really gorgeous way for us to access each other as a global community. Um, when the quarantine first started, I was actually quarantined in, in Chile. And um, of course, my only way of communicating and connecting with my community was through technology. And I like probably many of you out there had a, a little moment of like oh my gosh wait a minute how do I do this when I don't see people's faces and expressions how are we going to navigate this but little by little what happened as I surrendered into that feeling of discomfort as I discovered wow we can connect together from everywhere and so this is what you are creating now Julia is this opportunity for the 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 community that 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 taps into this and hopefully it will become an example for many other communities to create um, a growing network. So um, although, <laughs> although I, I started um, really officially teaching yoga in Chicago, where I was actually practicing integrative medicine because I'm also a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. So I, like many um, sharers of yoga, did start in a, in a studio life teaching some classes. And mostly my passion was really giving yoga homework to my patients because I found it a very tangible way to tap into the healing process, something like a, a goodie bag at the end of a party. You have a session with a patient and then you give them something right that they can take responsibility for to help them on their healing path so that's really where my passion in in sharing yoga began but little by little especially as my life became more destabilized uh, what I began to discover is this whole world of yoga retreats and of course yoga teacher trainings that now we're on an interesting precipice even there what what how things will evolve in in this modern world and this more separated world um but the my my passion really began to grow for taking people out of their norm when when someone has the opportunity to travel right already we we talk about so much in, in yoga, in, in classes, in our practices, even if you're just on the mat physically about this idea of letting go. And what is the ultimate letting go, but just to step away from all the habits that you have in your everyday life. You get up at a certain time, you eat a certain thing for breakfast, you go this way to work. And I mean, that is a little perhaps excessive for many of us practicing yoga because we're really trying to create diversity in our program, but I'm sure you kind of get what I mean. But what I discovered little by little is that there is this phenomenal opportunity when people travel, because not only are their eyes opened to something completely different, whether it is what love looks like or what life looks like or what a family looks like or what success looks like or maybe just the exploration of a new culture but it also gives us an opportunity to confront a little more easily 
what our natural habits are because who of you out there hasn't taken a trip and had one moment where you're like, oh, I miss my pillow or, oh, I just wish I had my own coffee, you know, and these like little ways that we have the opportunity when we travel to recognize the ways that we kind of attach ourselves to a certain way of life. And so from that gentle experience, what I started doing is creating yoga retreat experiences because what better companion to being completely decent stabilized is there other than our yoga practice, right? Probably most of us are really feeling that a lot right now. And another reason why this is such a, a beautiful offering is to, to have this way of staying present, to have this way of maybe even just staying in breath, right? Just not, not holding our breath when things start to, to feel. And so um, my passion these last seven years has been creating these ways. And, and this will also be interesting for, for me in this moment as well. Julia so kindly asked me to talk about what I'm doing in case anyone out there is interested in joining me. And I have to tell you in this moment, I don't even know what's gonna happen to these trips right now, but I'm in the process of recreating how to recreate also in a lot of different ways. So for the last seven years, my focus has really been on taking people all over the planet from Nepal to Patagonia, to Greece, to Portugal, and really helping people dive into new experiences, new perspectives with the companionship of the yoga practice. And so not only going deeper into the practice because you take it out of your normal setting, but also going deeper in your life because you take yourself out of your normal setting. And in conjunction with this, I do a few teacher trainings um, throughout the year as well. Another one of my passions is um, I do a few level one teacher trainings and any of you who have ever considered doing a teacher training, I just want to offer this invitation that um, really the, the people that I see that get the most out of these trainings are really the ones that just want to deepen their practice. And it's just like anything in life, when you really take the time to dive in into your own experience, then all of a sudden, you don't even have to have the desire that you want to share. All of a sudden, you're just sharing because it becomes so much who you are and how you're living your life that all of a sudden your life just blossoms as yoga and you find yourself sharing and these are really the most gorgeous teachers we have walking around life right now are not those necessarily who create the studio spaces even though those are so important but really the people that are just walking the walk and living their yoga and that's a beautiful segue into our topic of the koshas um, and and many of us come to some sort of spiritual path, whether it's yoga or anything else, but I'm just gonna make the assumption that those of you um, joining us today and listening to this lecture are on some, even one small step onto the path of, of yoga, but right, most of us come, come into this endeavor with some sort of question. And that question could be as simple as, I just want to live a healthier life. I just want to live a happier life. And I say a simple question, but as many of us know, that's not always a simple endeavor to figure out what is healthier and happier, but okay, just put that aside for right now. But you know, it's, it's a little bit like, I don't even know what this yoga thing is, but I'm going to step in because I see, and, and there's sort of a claim of yoga, right? That it can bring us a little closer to happiness. And it can also be as complicated as I just want to change my whole life. I don't know what I believe anymore. I'm a lot of modern life. A lot of the way that I see people living their lives isn't making a lot of sense to me. And I'm sort of attracted to this idea of unity. So let me dive into the deep end and, and see where that leads me. But wherever it is that you've come um, into your relationship with yoga, there's typically an underlying question to any spiritual path. And that is ultimately, who am I? Right? The question is really like, who are we? And I guess what often goes with that is what are we doing here? And um, if we really addressed both of those questions today, we would be here for six hours. But since we have this beautiful little hour, what we're gonna do is, is take this um, little window of yoga and this idea of the five koshas, and we're gonna look together a little bit at this question of like, who are we? And the thing is, is that there are actually kind of two answers, right? So if I just start by asking you, like, who are you? 
And usually on Zoom, it gets a little bit chaotic, right? But I would ask you just to one word answer, who are you? And maybe some people are thinking I'm human. Maybe some people are thinking I'm mom. Maybe some people are thinking I'm peace. You know, whatever it is, there is, is something. But have any of you ever heard this idea that there is a part of you that is universal? There is a part of you that is divine. Just think about it because most of us who have been exposed to any kind of whether you're just even sitting right in the beginning of the class and the teacher asks you to close your eyes and take a deep breath and connect to the infinite in you. Many of us in the beginning, we might not even consider what that is. We're just thinking, okay, well, maybe there is something infinite, right? But in a way, the tricky part of this endeavor is there are two I am's. Because where we start, this whole process is in the physical realm. And I don't know if any of you saw my introduction video. I'm not so good at making those videos, but I talked a little bit about, right, most of us come into this process of yoga um, through the physical experience. And we can't really deny that whatever answer you gave, you are mom, you are sister, you are warrior, you are love, you are peace. All of these things are true about you. But there's sort of this partnership then between that and what most philosophical traditions will say, which is the true self. And many of you might know that as the Atman, many of you might know that as the Brahman, and these are other terms a little bit beyond this talk. But I just want to introduce this idea that whatever it is that you are believing and feeling right now is also true. And there might be a true self yet to discover in this whole process. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. And now what we're gonna do is like a Russian doll, right? Like, or, or maybe an onion. I was cutting onions earlier and having a nice um, cleansing cry while I was cutting the onion or like peeling an onion, we're gonna begin to discover. And, you know, I, I will say too, like this, question of, of who am I is, is a little bit elusive. And I, I understand that it's, it's actually quite a huge topic. And it, it, one thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is this idea of what is yoga. And it's another question that when I enter into the philosophical um, realm with students, I love to ask, what is yoga to you in this moment? Because for sure the diversity of what that question is. And again, you'll all be right in some way, but there is also this true idea of yoga that is sort of like our divine self or sort of like our infinite self that is really the true nature of all. Let's pause for a second. Okay. So when I teach philosophy, and some of you um, that might end up listening to this recording as well might have heard this is my own philosophy, and many of us are familiar with the butterfly effect, yes, this um, concept. Are, are you familiar with the, the butterfly effect? Yeah, the flapping of the wings. So I have my own version of the butterfly effect story, and it kind of goes like this. So. If you'd like, you can close your eyes, but imagine that you are a scientist and you're a scientist and you're standing outside one of those beautiful domes that houses butterflies, all kinds of butterflies, thousands of butterflies. And your boss gives you a jar and says, what I'd like for you to do is enter the butterfly house and learn all you can possibly learn about the butterflies. So you, as the diligent scientist, you take your jar, you unscrew the cap, you enter the butterfly house, and you just start collecting butterflies for every, every butterfly you can possibly get. You just grab and you stuff in the jar and whoop, the top of the jar goes on and you screw it on and you say, wow, I really have like stuffed a lot into this jar. And then you start to look at the jar and you see an antenna here and an eyeball here and maybe a, a wing that's like bent and it kind of looks blue, but maybe there's pink on the inside and you see all these little bits and pieces of things, but it's quite difficult to really understand what is really there and what that might mean. Pause. Back up. Scene number two. 
exit the butterfly house, now you're a different scientist. So let's call that scientist A. And now you're scientist B. And the boss gives you the same instruction. You have an empty jar, you take the lid off and you enter the butterfly house. You put the jar down and you just stand. And little by little after some time, a beautiful butterfly comes and lands on your shoulder. And you look over and you see the butterfly's form and you understand the butterfly's shape and maybe you see how the butterfly moves and you understand the colors and you see the pattern and then that butterfly flies away and maybe after some time another one lands on the hand and again the same thing you watch and you investigate and you see the whole picture in its entirety so the question here is which scientist would you rather be a or if anyone has, you can, I know we're in limited numbers, but most likely you're gonna say probably B, yeah? I mean, even in the tone of the voice, right? It feels so much more calming to be scientist B instead of the type A, scientist A. Why is it nice to be scientist B? And why is this a butterfly story that I tell you at the beginning of a philosophy lesson is because philosophy is a lot like this. The endeavor of learning and approaching philosophy is a lot like this. The more you try to cram in all at the same time, the less you're really gonna understand. So as we embark on this little journey today, what I really want to encourage you to do is just let what butterfly land on you or what butterflies may land on you, land on you. And that is something that you're ready for. It's something that you're receptive to. And it's going to be exactly what you need to get out of this next hour together. If instead you try to cram everything together, the chances are that you're going to come away with maybe even a misunderstanding of something. So I always love to encourage students, especially with the philosophical endeavors, to really dig within and approach this time together with a lot of patience and just a lot of openness. Set your jar down. There's nothing you need to check off the list while we talk about these ideas only what really comes to you and resonates with you, that's going to be the gift you carry away. And I promise you the next time you walk into the butterfly house, if this maybe inspires you to walk in again and again and again, every single time something new is going to land and something new is going to stay with you a little bit longer. And that is going to allow you little by little to really begin to understand and explore these philosophical ideas of yoga. So I always like to start there. Now with all of those words that I've already said, since I'm certain that we're gathering together from all different places, maybe you're in a different timing of your day, just before I say more words, I would love for you to find a comfortable seat if you haven't already. Go ahead and close your eyes not to shut out the world around you, but rather just to give yourself an opportunity to listen in a different way. And with your eyes closed and your body with each breath, just relaxing and softening a little more. Just become aware of your breath. And there's no need to change anything here. No need to search for anything in particular in the breath but just the simplicity of orienting the mind's eye, the imagination here on the breath. And maybe you have the natural tendency to want to sigh a little bit to blow off some of the residue or dust of what preceded this time together and go ahead and follow that if that's the natural inclination. And otherwise, just stick with this experience of taking in and letting go, soft and easy. And with the breath maybe growing a little bit more tranquil and maybe naturally a little bit more full, begin to become very aware of your body. 
And again, try your best here not to begin immediately to label or judge what you find along the way, but almost as if you're imagining your body from outside, just begin to feel and sense and see in your imagination the entirety of your body. Feeling that you really do exist in time and space. And the breath continues soft and easy. And following that sensation, that heightened awareness of your body, begin to move your awareness to the very edges of the body, almost as if your awareness could become very, very keen on all the surfaces of your skin. And with the deep, soft, even breath and the quiet mind that's just watching patiently like the scientist who set the jar down, begin to imagine that the breath could move in and out of your body through all the surfaces of your skin. If you find any resistance along the way, or you find that it's not so easy to imagine this, just notice that that's your experience and come again to the idea and see if you can follow it a little more deeply each time you try. The breath, deep and soft and even, And the imagination beginning to understand that the breath enters and exits through every surface of your skin. The very outline of the entirety of you is breathing in and breathing out. And wherever you are along this investigation, just count three more deep breaths like this. And at the end of your third exhale, Keep the mind's eye on the experience of the breath, but let go of all of the other imagination. Just return to the experience of your natural breath. Allow the face to soften, the shoulders to soften. And then as you're ready, just let your eyes flutter open. Great. Do you feel a little bit more present, a little bit more ready to receive? Good. And you know, I just want to say that the, the practice of, of yoga, you know, in our modern world um, has become a little bit complicated, actually. And, and many of us do get a little bit caught up in, in the physical practice, which we're gonna talk about shortly, um, that has a really deep importance, that has a, a really important place in the path of yoga. But throughout the day, as we're kind of returning to that idea, right, of just walking the walk of yoga, it can be as simple as two minutes of closing our eyes and breathing and returning to ourselves, however it is that we're deciding to define that in this moment, in this crossroads in, in life. So a nice thing to remember and welcome again to this section on the koshas. So as we begin to, to talk about the koshas, so what are the koshas? The koshas, this word in, in Sanskrit is often translated as um, sheaths 
And this is, I have found, because most of my teacher trainings are very international, so this word sheath is sometimes a hard word for non-native English speakers, so I'll spell it, S-H-E-A-T-H, sheath. And that is, is sort of resembling, right, like a thin layer over something. And I like this definition because it gives a, a, a sense of sort of lightness, um, but the reason that I don't love this translation, and um, I like to give my opinions about these things, so take it with a grain of salt, because that's the beauty of learning from so many different teachers, is everyone has their different way of storytelling. But when you, when you think about a sheath, or even like a sheet, right, for, for me, what I think is layers. And we are going to talk about layers, but when I think about layers, I also think about a hierarchy. Right, something maybe more important or less important. And of course, in yoga, because we're little by little trying to move away from, from judgment and definition in some ways, then when we start talking about the layers of ourselves, it can be a little bit tricky. So another way that this idea of kosha is defined is just bodies. And in the practice of yoga, and, and actually this information comes to us from way before yoga was even a, a lineage, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a second, but this idea of koshas is that we have five of them as human beings. And the um, definition that I like the best is to call them the five bodies. And why do I like this definition the most? So today we're going to look at the five koshas, the five bodies that each of us has in this life. And what these five bodies are, are the ways through which we experience life. So essentially what the koshas are, are five bodies that we have in our perceivable existence. I'm going to say that one more time because again, even that you're like, if already your brain's like, whoa, what did she just say? Don't worry. Remember the scientist and just let the butterflies land because little by little, we're going to unpeel the onion. So the five koshas or the five bodies are the five ways through which we perceive life, including how we perceive ourselves. Okay. So as you might have read somewhere along the line, this whole week is really about the subtle body. So this is another definition that I want to just start out with, and that's this idea of subtle. What is something that is subtle, and what does that mean specifically in this? Because it's another tricky thing with words, right, is that in one um, paradigm, subtle can mean one thing and another and another. So this specifically is the idea of subtlety in the philosophy of yoga. And how I think the easiest way to sort of begin to understand this idea of subtle is through the idea of vibration. So what I would love for you to just try on for the next 45 minutes or hour or weeks, however long it resonates with you, is that all of life is vibration. Anything that we perceive, that we understand, that we feel, that even, even, well, you can't, you're not in the room with me, but I'm looking at this really old, like, stove that's on a concrete floor. Like, even that is made of vibration. And the best way to understand this idea that all of life is vibration is the example of water. And it's one that we have all experienced in our lives at some point. Point, right? So water has all of these different forms. And when the vibration of water is very slow, it's in the form of ice. So in the form of something that is really tangible, that we could pick up in our hand, that we can feel, that we can touch, right? When the vibration of water begins to increase a little bit in, um, Oh, I'm losing my word. But when the vibration increases, right, becomes a little bit higher vibration, then we experience water as water. But I don't know if you've ever like placed your hand in a running river. You know that your hand is touching water, but it's sort of like, hmm, 
I know it's water, but there's also something already a little bit mysterious about it, yes? That, that the water is moving through your hand, past your hand. It can kind of mold and shape, so it's not really something that you can pick up. And I mean, even if you do pick it up, right, it falls right through your hands unless you're lucky enough to take a sip before that happens. And then if the vibration of water heightens even more, it becomes steam. And depending on your situation and depending on the temperature of your environment, steam is something that we can see, but it also often is something that we can't see. Our, our whole environment is filled with steam in a way, right? Little water molecules that are floating around that we can't see. And so I present this as sort of our foundation of understanding what is subtle. And subtle in this particular example would really be this idea of steam. We know it exists. But we can't necessarily touch it. We can't necessarily see it. We might even experience it. You experience it. If you go to Brazil and you're in the rainforest, you're sweating, you're damp, you like really feel the humidity in the air. If you go to the arid plains of the Pampa in Argentina and Patagonia, you don't necessarily feel the steam, but it's still there, right? So there's sort of this mysterious thing where it definitely exists, but we can't necessarily see or touch. And this is the idea of subtlety that we're also going to dive into today. And sometimes what this brings us to the precipice of is what is real and what is not real. Does anyone get that sensation when, when you're sort of like, well, so steam exists, yes, but I can't feel it, I can't touch it. And another example that, that I've given a lot is sort of the idea of emotions too, right? Emotion has a vibration, it is a thing, it does exist, but we can't really touch it, we can't really grab onto it. We definitely feel it, right, depending on the emotion, for sure. But like, what is it? What shape does it have? Where is it in time and space? So something that we know exists, but something that we can't necessarily feel or touch is the endeavor that we're embarking on. So we're going to dive into this pool of the koshas by again returning to this question, who am I? And if I asked you, and if you were able to answer, another probable answer is like, well, I'm this, I'm, I'm this. For sure I know I'm this. And many of us in the modern world, right, are really trying to figure out who in the world we are. But for sure we identify in some way with the physical body. Sorry if you can hear that little um, sound outside of my daughter coming home on her motorbike. So, <clears throat> That's also real, even though you can't see it and you can't feel it and you can't touch it. So just another little example in the reality of, of what's going on. So five bodies through which we experience life, yes? And this information, I just want to say, comes to, so the, the information, the lineage of yoga is something that develops from what we call beginningless time. And there are two major texts from what we say maybe 4,000, 5,000 years ago, maybe even 4,000, 5,000 BCE, called the Vedas and the Upanishads. And I'm sorry I'm throwing a lot of things, a lot of new words, but again, just, you know, just hear it and then you'll hear it again if it's something that, that you want to investigate. But what we know is the practice of yoga actually didn't arrive until around 300 or 400 AD, right? And so where the information of the koshas actually originates, one of the first times it's brought to us in written form is from the Upanishads. So, so something that is still very universal. And the reason that I even say this is because another important aspect of, of endeavoring in the philosophy of yoga is to know that the way we're experiencing yoga in the modern age is through so many different storytellers of a very similar story. But this idea of the koshas, there's something quite beautiful about it because it isn't a very modern thing. And it comes to us from a time when the teachings were really without differentiation into families or lineages of what those teachings eventually became to help people, depending on their culture or their time in life, to re-access this universal wisdom. I hope that made sense. But essentially, the koshas 
come to us, this idea that we have five bodies comes to us from a time where these teachings were still very universal and really without a particular tradition. And then little by little, each tradition has given their own storytelling voice to how we can understand the koshas, okay? So the first kosha, can you believe it? We finally made it to the koshas. <laughs> All of this preparation. Okay, so we finally made it to the first kosha. And the first kosha, and we have um, also a Word document. So for those of you watching even the recording, if you would like to see some of these words in, in writing, I can provide you just with some limited notes. But if you haven't already, maybe grab a pen and a piece of paper. So the first kosha is called Anamaya Kosha. And again, when we ask the question, who am I? Most of us say, well, okay. I can at least like say I am I am this. And in fact, this is what Anamaya Kosha is. In many translations, it's called the food body or the physical body. And this is the most gross layer of our existence. So the most tangible, the one that we can definitely most say is for real. And you know. I, I was so excited to teach this section that I didn't even take a second to tell you why I look like an American football player. And that is because I had a little horse accident a week ago. So if, if I'm so sorry, may, maybe some of your minds are still oscillating on what kind of makeup does this woman have on? So I just have a little bruises because I have a broken nose. So I know for sure my body is real because I felt it when that horse placed her head against my head and broke my nose, right? And most of us have this definite experience even when we wake up in the morning and we're, uh. so the Anamaya Kosha is called the food body. And one scientist lovingly said that our body is simply food rearranged. Do I need to pause for a second? No, we're fine, okay. Um, one scientist said that we're just simply food rearranged. And so, as many of you know, this kosha, this first body, is very tangible, it is very real, and so it's really the most likely place for us to begin the practice of yoga. And in fact, most of you probably listening are hatha yoga, yogi practitioners, maybe even kundalini, right? But we are starting with the experience of the body in our investigation of life because the body is something for sure undeniable and what we want to sort of begin thinking about is also this bigger idea of what is yoga right what is this idea of unification and in hatha yoga we talk a lot about breath and body coming together why because when we bring our breath and body together we're creating some sort of harmony but what we're going to sort of look at today, too, is that at all five levels, we also want to be curious about how to bring the greatest harmony to each of these five levels so that we are really looking through the lens of all of our five bodies in the most honest way. And um, I, I, I don't usually, but it's just coming to me today, maybe also because it's a full moon and there's a lot of energy seeming to be circling around today, but um, uh, many of you have probably heard, heard the idea that in yoga we talk about a vegetarian diet. And so if we think about this Anamaya Kosha, right, as the food body, as something that is literally created by the food and the drink, and eventually we'll come to see also the breath to some extent, but, but really like we are what we eat. And it's a cliche that I'm sure exists in every single culture. There must be some form of this, you are what you eat. And this actually is another sort of um, little jumping off point to understand why yogis adhere to a vegetarian diet. And I'll just say this as a real quick side note, because a lot of people um, are, are curious to know the why behind some of these things. So this is potentially one answer there. And that is that um, fruits and vegetables, right, that are growing from the earth, things that are growing from the earth are really close to the resonance and consciousness of nature. But as life evolves and as creatures come to have their own consciousness, sort of like us as humans, they also begin to experience emotions and thoughts. And as I'm pretty sure most of us would agree, our thoughts can really affect 
the nature of how we experience our body. And so if you consider that by eating an animal, and this is not in any way, shape or form telling you, you must be a vegetarian, I'm just giving you another way to look at it since we're on the physical body, is that when you eat an animal purportedly, you are also taking the essence and the energy of all of the thoughts and all of the emotions that that animal had before they died. Whereas by eating a vegetarian diet, and there's a lot of side notes there too about how food is grown, where it's grown, what is the soil, who is the farmer, et cetera, et cetera. So just go general picture with me here, right? By keeping to that vegetarian diet, we are literally building our own bodies out of more pure substances. And by pure, I don't mean that animals aren't pure. By pure, I mean less oscillating of the mind. And if anyone has studied the yoga sutras, right, one of the very first definitions of yoga there is simply the stilling of the oscillations of the mind. And so how we experience our body will come to see has a very strong effect on how we experience all of these other bodies. And so that's just a little side note. But back to who am I? Am I this body? Are you that body? Probably some part of us will say yes, but think about yourself as a baby and then think about yourself as a teenager. And then maybe think about yourself when you're going to be 99 years old and still practicing yoga. Your body has changed a lot, hasn't it? But you are still you, right? So in essence, when we look at it this way, we can't necessarily say that we are our body, but we can say that we experience life through our body. And in fact, that's one of the really important reasons that many of us enter and that Hatha Yoga invites us to enter the practice of yoga through the physical body is that the asana practice in its greatest simplicity is a way to purify the body. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday when we talk about the actual energy pathways in the body. But the asana practice is a way to bring greater harmony to the body. And who of us has not experienced this, right? You go through a yoga practice, no matter how demanding, and you lay down in Shavasana at the end and you're like, I love life. You're so happy for that moment, right? You're like in peace. Everything makes sense. You're comfortable in your own skin. It's absolute bliss. And then unfortunately, what often happens is we get up off our mat, we greet our teacher, we greet our fellow yogis, we go out into the world. And within seconds, we're kind of distracted again by all sorts of other things. And we start to feel uncomfortable in our body. But this first kosha and um, I'm, I'm just starting to understand, so I'm going to try to check myself, is that I get off topic a lot, but definitely through Zoom, I can see that the possibility for this, so I'm going to try to be aware of time, Julia, <laughs> and also tell you lots of stories. So this first kosha, Anamaya kosha, right, is the place that we usually embark on our investigation of yoga and understanding who am I. But if we take that example of, you know, being a, a small child, being a this, how many of you woke up this morning feeling one way in your body and whatever you've done up until the point where you greet this video, you feel like you might be living in a different body, right? So it's something that is constantly changing. And this is another truth of life is that everything is always changing. But so this begins to start already feeling really interesting, right? If I'm asking, who am I? And for sure, my body is part of who I am, but it isn't who I am. Does that make sense? Because if this is always changing, but I'm still the same person, then that's my first layer of experiencing life. Yeah? Another way to look at it before we jump into the second body is we are the seer and the body is the scene. And it's another kind of, I think that along the way, there, there, there come sort of different chapters of our experience in life. And I, I think most of us along the way, at one point or another, do feel a little bit uncomfortable in our body. But one of the beautiful gifts of the yoga practice, I believe, is sort of teaching us that we can not only shape our perception of this, obviously, because we want to feel at home in this vessel. Like this is, this is the vessel, whether we like it or not. And there are some funny ways that we can change it and maybe make ourselves feel better about it. But 
really it is it is through the asana practice that we begin to feel more at home in our skin and that we begin to understand that we can actually change how the body feels right by how we sleep by how we eat by even what company we're keeping and that starts to get us into the second kosher right but so many ways i love to always take a step back after presenting an idea to just remind us that remember we're always in choice right we're always in choice and we're always capable of taking some action to get us a little bit closer to, toward where we want to be and so one teacher said to me once like we're the seer and the body is the scene and i loved this because i thought oh well, I've been in theater before, you know, so if I'm the seer, because obviously I'm not changing what my body is, then I can maybe create the scene that I really want to work with also, right? By practicing more consistently, by eating foods that I know make me feel good, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just wanted to offer this little, it didn't come from me directly, but it's, it's one of the little phrases about Anamaya Kosha that I just love, that we are the seer and the body is the scene. This is your stage. So how do you want to set your stage? This is where we embark on this idea of, of who we are. So the second body is called Pranamaya Kosha. And Pranamaya Kosha is often um, defined as the energy body. Uh, sometimes it's called the vital body, and I'll tell you why in just a second. But um, I, I like this idea that it's the energy body. And if you are already cluing in to a little bit of this vocabulary, or if you happen to have your sheet in front of you, what you're seeing right there is the word prana. And those of you who have taken any kind of hatha yoga practice know that pranayama is also part of our practice ritual in, in hatha yoga. And so um, the question that we started on in this endeavor that I'm taking you on many side streets and into the deep forest on um, is who am I? And so prana is the energy that animates your body. Prana is also the energy that animates all of life. It is the way vibration is behaving to create action in life. Did that make sense? in some ways. There are many different definitions of prana, but let's stick with this one. It is an animating force for us. And what's interesting about prana, pranamaya kosha is that pranamaya kosha, they say, or is taught, takes a very similar form to the physical body. And so if you can imagine already, you have these two bodies, so a physical form and the animating force that is making that physical form active in life. It's kind of a cool thing, actually, when you think about it that way, or I guess maybe I've never said it that way, and I'm thinking it's really cool, but I think all of this stuff is cool. So pranamaya kosha is also sometimes called the breath body, and that brings us back right to the practice of pranayama, when we are cultivating the breath, not so different than our asana practice does with the physical body, but we're cultivating our breath to create a different flow of energy in the body, right? So all of a sudden, as a yogi, I haven't even told you much about pranamaya kosha, but already as a yogi, you might be cluing into the fact as, okay, I still don't know who I am, but I know I have a physical body. And now Molly's saying, like, I've got this energy body, which probably most of us, it's not so far-fetched to imagine because we talk about it a lot and we can't deny that there is some vibration, some force that is actually animating our body. And I have asana and I have pranayama. I have these two tools as a yogi already that she's telling me help to cultivate the harmony of these first two levels. So that's kind of neat. And it feels pretty empowering in a way that we again have choice and sort of the capability to move with and experience these bodies. When we move into pranamaya kosha, we are taking our first step into the subtle body, the real subtle body. Why? Because if I say to you, there's a force that animates you, you're going to say, mm -hmm. yeah, I think probably most of us wouldn't, wouldn't want to deny that. But if I said, like, what is it? What does it look like? 
What color is it? What shape does it have? Mm. Then it starts getting a little tricky, right? So the yoga philosophy, again, does say that pranamaya kosha takes a form very similar to the body, but maybe extends just a little bit beyond the edges of anamaya kosha, beyond the edges of the physical body. And this is also why pranamaya kosha is also said to be what people see when they see an aura. And aura is a little bit beyond the yoga philosophy, but it's something that I think in our modern day that, that people talk a lot about, you know, the aura, or I see colors. And even if you've never seen an aura, you've definitely felt pranamaya kosha in someone else. And I'll tell you why. Have you ever been walking down the street and you walk by some people and maybe they smile at you. Maybe you never make contact and you feel just fine. And then maybe you walk by another person and you're like, oh, you have some other kind of feeling and you don't know why, but it's definitely there. Why? It's because that person's pranamaya kosha is vibrating in a way that isn't so synergistic to the way you're vibrating. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean you're good. It doesn't mean vice versa. But have you had this experience? Have you had this experience? Yeah, right. We, we have all had um, e even on this kind of level. So we, we have this energy that animates our body, but our original question was, who am I? So am I this energy? Well, of course, you know that I'm going to say yes, in some way you are, because it's undeniable that you have an energy that animates you. But that energy, just like the physical body, is always changing. Maybe this morning you woke up and you felt really tired and then you had a beautiful yoga practice and you felt completely energized. Your pranamaya kosha shifted, right? The way you are perceiving and experiencing this vital energy shifted. Sometimes we're sick, sometimes we're well, but is it the same you who is sick? And is it the same you who is well? Yes, right? So then, are you this pranamaya kosha? Hmm. Well, yes, because you're experiencing life through pranamaya kosha, but maybe it's not the true to self because we know that this is another body through which we experience life that is always changing. Um, another thing that um, is interesting to note because I said that pranamaya kosha is, is, is the energy body, but I also said that is the breath body. And we're gonna begin to make a deeper connection here with a third body in just a second. But it, it is, I, I guess I just wanna return for, for a moment because for, for me, it's really beautiful to take in philosophy in our head. But it's another, and it's why I like to really try to give to, my, to, to the best of my ability for as much life as I've lived up until this point, like really real examples of how we can connect what we're hearing to what we really experience. Because learning philosophy is, is really beautiful and it has like many concepts that it's easy to say, oh yeah, okay, that's so interesting. But if we don't root it into how we're actually experiencing life in this moment, then it will very easily sort of fly away from us. Yes, does that make sense? And it's something that, that I wrote a lot about last year with the, the advent of social media and, and the sharing of information. And there's something, there's like a modern disease and I like to call it beautiful quote syndrome. So when you, you know, scour Facebook and Instagram, how many beautiful quotes do you see? So many people post the most beautiful one sentence ideas, right? And you're like, like, yes, oh yes. So, so what I say is, okay, so that's like your philosophy class. Now print out that beautiful quote, put it on your refrigerator and do your best to live it every day for a year. And then tell me how you feel about it. And this is also another real beautiful gift of yoga. And, and I think with, um, oh, I'm forgetting his name, Paul, you're going to get some, Steve? Oh, you're, Steve, yeah. You're going to get some experiential, those of you who are following this whole week. Did I say it right now, Steve? Yeah. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> you're going to get some experiential. But, but again, really making sure that, that every butterfly that, that lands on us, then we take that 
concept and, and we reapply it and we really do our best to root it into real life. And in this way, we really begin to understand what we're understanding about it all. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I'm going to look down at my notes because I feel myself just getting really excited about um, these five koshas and we've only done two of them, but they're kind of two heavy heater hitters, right? So the, of the five, perceivable layers of our existence, we begin with Anamaya Kosha, the physical body, the food body. You are what you eat. And then we move into the subtle bodies or the subtle body with Pranamaya Kosha. So this body through which we experience the animation of life. As yogis, we have a tool to help us cultivate this, which is with our Pranayama practice through our breath work. But as you can imagine, we have also many other tools that we begin to see can really affect even how this energy moves. And using that example of walking by someone in the street, also, have you ever walked into a place where you just think, hmm, I just don't feel that good here, right? So that not feeling good is something to really take note about because that is affecting how the vital energy of your existence, of your perceivable existence in this life is moving. And sometimes we can't always change our environment, right? Sometimes we don't have that choice or sometimes it's a work environment. And that's why yoga is such a brilliant science because it gives us tools to help us navigate to the best of our ability, especially those kinds of situations, just like the asana practice, just like the pranayama practices. So moving from prana maya kosha to the third kosha, which is called mano maya kosha. And this is the body. This is the mind. This is your mind. And the mind, a little tricky, right? How many of us haven't ever experienced our mind wanting to sabotage us in some form or another? And sabotage is a very strong word. But again, we want to really connect with all the varying ways. Sometimes our minds are completely lucid and clear and we know what it is that we're seeing. We know what it is that, that we're feeling, right? And there is a huge, and again, I bring Shavasana. Shavasana, I love Shavasana. Why? Because Shavasana is this place where we just begin to touch the idea of yoga. You do all the work and you think maybe you're doing yoga or that you are like being yoga. But in Shavasana, if you've really been attentive in your practice and actually you're really being attentive in your Shavasana and you're not snoring, it's in that moment, right, and we're all guilty of it, so no judgment. I've done it also. Um, <laughs> there is that moment where Anamaya Kosha is fluid and harmonized, where Pranamaya Kosha is fluid and harmonized. And this next Kosha, right, the mind, this next layer through which we experience life, this next body through which we experience life, which is called the mind, is also often in its most fluid state. And I don't know about you, but, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it, I'm just um, laughing a little bit because sometimes I often say that there are three places where I have my most brilliant ideas. When I'm walking alone in the forest, and walking is a beautiful meditation. When I'm taking a long shower, which is bad because we shouldn't waste water, or when I'm lying in Shavasana. And it's because for me, those three places are the places where these first three layers of our perceivable existence are usually in the greatest harmony. And I'm sure that you can think of your own sort of way to understand, but Shavasana is an experience that we all share. Right. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes in that brilliant state of, of harmony where we experience this idea of mind in a little bit greater stillness, and then the teacher like rings a bell and you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, shoot. You know, and the mind starts thinking because we have to perceive what's changing in our environment. But Manamaya Kusha is our thinking mind. And again, if we go back to 
um, the sutras, right, which is the, the yoga sutras is another really important text in the, the lineage of yoga. And it's really the first time actually that the physical practice is even mentioned in the whole lineage of yoga. But again, one of the definitions of yoga in the sutras is the stilling of the mind. And why are these moments so brilliant is has anyone had this experience where in that moment of Shavasana or in the shower or walking in the woods or whatever you interjected into that line I just gave you to fill in, you have really these states of like moments of grace, moments where something makes the most sense that it ever has to you, even if it has made sense before, it's like something kind of settles down the silt of the river, all of a sudden settles down and life or any aspect of life is like, oh, I get it. Have you ever had that? Yeah. And so the yoga sutras, right, are presenting us sort of this idea that brings us to the third of the kushas, which is yoga, this idea of unification or this idea of knowing our true selves is a stilling of the oscillations of the mind. And I heard something, I was listening to this very interesting lecture um, the other day, so I'm going to interject it because a lot of people really love also to see how sort of the science of yoga and modern science interject, but um, an, a neuroscientist was giving a lecture and saying, we have 60,000 thoughts per day, 60,000 thoughts per day. I don't know about you, but even just thinking of that number makes me tired. But of course, our mind makes us tired all the time, right? Of those 60,000 thoughts per day, 90% of them are exactly the same as the day before. So interesting, right? And so mind is, is a tricky little body that we're dealing with because its tendency is movement. And as we mentioned, when we started with Anamaya Kosha, and I said to you, well, who are you? Are you the little girl? Are you the middle-aged person? Are you the old person? Well, you're all of those, but... Anamaya Kosha is constantly changing. And from there, we sort of jumped into the deep end of the fact that all of life is change. And the mind is in constant motion, which is some kind of change. But we also really love in this physical existence to try to find stability via attachment. And the mind is the most superior superhero of this. If you have 60,000 thoughts per day and 90% of them are exactly the same as yesterday, but if you go back to one of the first questions that I asked you, like, why did you even come into your spiritual path? Why did you come? Because you wanted to change something, right? So, okay, the body doing handstand, headstand, this is kind of interesting. Okay, pranayama, this is also kind of interesting. And one of the ways that we're interacting with life, but mind Ooh, this is where it really starts to get interesting because we come across a lot of duality. So Manamaya Kosha is this third body through which we experience life. And in some ways, it's truly brilliant. Why? Because it is said that Manamaya Kosha, part of its job, part of its function as one of our five bodies is to translate information from pranamaya kosha to anamaya kosha. So everything that we're experiencing at the layer of the energy body, part of manamaya kosha's job, part of your mind's job, or actually the majority of it, it's just that we get easily distracted, is to share information between the breath body and the physical body and between the physical body and the breath body. And I'm going to pause here because I left out something really, really important. And that is, is that at the layer of pranamaya kosha, in this layer of the energy body, is where the chakras, the nadis, and the emotions reside. So what already was maybe already a powerhouse of an idea, I just want to return there because I know that some of you have been investigating quite deeply through a lot of really interesting practices, the chakras for sure. We're going to dive into the nadis on Wednesday, but this level of our vital body, that which animates 
right? The physical body. This is also the layer within which we find emotions, the chakras, the nadis, all of the different movements of vibrations that we experience. And now we have Manumaya Kusha, the mind, who of whom one of I'm just losing my words completely. Manamaya Kusha's major job is to carry the information of the emotions, the chakras, the nadis, and all the movements of vibration within the body to the physical body and vice versa. And so I'm going to pause here just while that settles in for a second because for sure many of you have heard this idea that yoga is a holistic approach to life or the, the sister science of Ayurveda, or I'm a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, also in Chinese medicine, which we're gonna talk a little bit about more in coming days, right? But in this idea of holism of a practice, what we often hear people talking about is this idea of reconnecting mind and body, no? Like reconnecting mind and body. and What's really nice to know, and I'm just gonna give you a little secret here, is that your mind and your body are never separate. It's just that sometimes there's so much information coming in between the body and the vital body, right? Anamaya kosha and pranamaya kosha, and the mind is trying to stabilize you in whatever reality you have decided to live in. Oof, that's a doozy. And so mind is taking this information and not only translating it, but also trying to recuperate it in some way, trying to morph it in some way to keep constant with what you have decided you already believe. Did that make sense? And that's why mind gets a little bit tricky because the nature of mind is really just to help us stay integrated. That's it except that mind also has the ability, right, to think and create thoughts. And a lot of the thoughts that we are living with are things that we already decided that we believe, right? I believe that life is such and such, even if we're not saying it every day, this is now a filter through which mind is moving to bring information from your emotional body, your breath body, your vital body to the physical body. And so in one way, I think it's nice to know that they can't ever be separated. They're never separated. We don't have to put ourselves back together like a broken car. But what we do have to begin to pay attention to and think about and investigate is whether the information of the mind is coming honestly from what is existing in the energy body or what is existing in the physical body or whether it is being filtered, and this is the reality of the human existence, is that it is being filtered through a lot of other decisions that we've already made. And so clearing the oscillations of the mind is one layer of reaching this idea of unity and arriving to an understanding of what is our true selves. But if any of you have walked down the path of even your asana practice long enough, right? One of the things that you start to understand is that you're kind of beginning to move through the jungle of what are my habitual thinking patterns? What are the thinking patterns that are having me see life not as it really is, but rather how I wish it was or how I hoped it was or how I thought it would be or what I was thinking it would be. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I'm not here to tell you the answer to that because the answer to that, and it's another beautiful gift of the yoga practice, right? They say you follow the path of yoga and, 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 you, and it will be revealed to you. But this is one of the ways through which we are experiencing life. But again, think about something that you interact with on a regular basis. It could even be your spouse, that's dangerous territory. But think about how you thought about your spouse or your partner or your sister or brother or someone close to you three years ago. And then think about how you think about them now. Is it the same? It is? Julia is shaking her head yes. 
kind of, exactly the same? No, right? It's not. And so it is another, when we return to that question, who am I? And if you're starting to feel a little hot under the collar, don't worry, I am too. Because if you're sitting down to peel the onion, for sure you're going to cry. And at about this point, this is when people are like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. Maybe I don't want to do this investigation at all. But I'm going to tell you why as a yogi, you're already way above the crowd. And that is, is that, well, first of all, let's just answer our question, who am I? You are the same person who had the thoughts about a thing or a person three years ago as the person who is having thoughts about that same subject or person now. The thoughts are probably different, even if in the most subtle way, but you are the same. So are you your mind? Yes and no. She's just making this very confusing for us. So we've made it to the, the third layer of our perceivable existence. We're still kind of in the investigation of who am I? And we now know that we have these three ways through which we are interacting with life, through our physical body, right? through our vital body, our energy body, our breath body, again, at which level we are interacting with our emotions, with the chakras, with our nadis. And the third level, manamaya kosha, even more subtle, let's say, than pranamaya kosha, which is the mind. And the mind is a beautiful connector of these two layers. So whether you feel integrated or not, you are integrated. But when we talk about integration, when we feel more integrated, right, what's happening is that the messages that are needing to be sent between the emotional body and the physical body and the physical body and the emotional body are either more in harmony or just simply less. And again, I return to Shavasana because this is a place where we experience these three levels of our perceivable existence in a deeper harmony. And for many of us, it is also a place where even though pranamaya kosha isn't a tangible thing, we're in the subtle body, it's a place where, do you remember that little meditation that I led you through in the beginning? And I asked you to imagine, but right, breathing through the surfaces of the body, why? Did anyone feel a sense of deeper integration in your body when I asked you to do that? or when I invited you to do that, sort of a, a different feeling of wholeness. Because essentially what I was inviting you to do was to feel how pranamaya kosha and how anamaya kosha, right, the physical body and the breath body are really relating to one another. And so in Shavasana, we often feel exactly that. Even if you're not putting a label on it, which you shouldn't be in that type of meditation, you are sort of feeling that sense of the breath expanding and contracting you, right? rather than you actually actively making the breath. So this is one level of integration. And then, as we said, if the breath is harmonious and the physical body is harmonious, the mind, as a result, is also a little more harmonious. And what's really cool about this is that on one hand, mm, I don't want to say judgment. So, okay, let me say it a different way. You didn't even hear the first way, but it went really fast in my head and it wasn't a good way. So let me tell you a better way. The, the better way to think about this is that as Hatha yogis or as yogis in the modern world, what's really neat and empowering, right? We talked about the physical body. We have asana. For pranamaya kosha, we also have pranayama. So we have these two practices easily relatable to these first two layers of our perceivable existence that help to harmonize. And another example I'll, I'll give, which is kind of really interesting, is has anyone ever had an emotional shock? I think none of us, right, if we're, if we're in our adult life and we've arrived to this point, I don't know that any of us hasn't had one of those moments where something happens, whether it's a breakup or a death or even just something unexpected happening in life. And what is typically the first thing we do? 
we hold our breath. Why? Because how we are receiving that shock or trauma is at the level of pranamaya kosha. And what manamaya kosha's job, again, the mind is to translate that experience to the physical body. And by holding our breath, what we're doing is temporarily protecting ourselves from feeling the physical result of the trauma. Does that make sense? And it's a beautiful defense mechanism and it works. The problem is, is that most of us in some way or another continue holding our breath. And what that does is hold that trauma in pranamaya kosha rather than allowing it to go through the natural process of being integrated through all of these different ways that we perceive and interact with life. Yeah. And this speaks to, again, this idea of holistic anything, holistic medicine. How can we deny then that what our emotions are affect the health of our physical body if we now know that our first three bodies, right, these first three levels, their whole purpose is to communicate to us through our physical experience and through our breath experience what is happening in life. And so this idea of holism, right, is facilitating a process that allows the actual process of both the physical experience of what is happening in pranamaya kosha, as well as if something happens on the physical level, how that translates and resonates in pranamaya kosha all via the mind. And so that holding of the breath in a way is a very beautiful first response because depending on the trauma, like we might not want to feel, you know, we might not be able to house that level of powerful energy in our physical body at first. But because most of us continue to hold our breath, what happens is that emotion doesn't go through its natural process and therefore becomes compost at the level of the chakras, the nadis, and our breath. And that compost becomes a new normal for the functioning of the body. And Manamaya Kosha makes up a story about this, why it's okay that this. And there are many results of this, but one of the major results is that our health is affected. And because most of us come to this path because we want a more vital experience in life, we want a happier existence, I just bring up this example to, to show you how, I mean, We've reached the third level and still we don't know who we are. But what I'm saying to you is that we've reached the third level and you are really powerful with your tools of yoga to keep harmony and to keep healthful processes, processes in almost every way that you are interacting and experiencing with life. Does that make sense? So while in some ways, sometimes when I present these ideas, it's easy to be like, oh gosh, what do I do with all of this information? But you're already doing it. And that's really special. If you're coming onto your mat and you're moving your body in a synchronized way and you're incorporating your breathing into that experience of moving your body, who of you haven't had an epiphany about who you are, in your mind during an experience of an asana practice. And that's exactly what the path of yoga is helping us to do, is to understand the honesty of all of these different ways that we are able to perceive ourselves and experience life through these five bodies. Make sense? Okay, so now we can all lower our shoulders a little bit and take a deep breath because it's a lot. It's a lot of information. And even there, right, going back to that beginning, who of us haven't ever had like one of those moments in life where we're like, I'm completely overwhelmed. I just need a second. Right? As yogis, we have the intelligence to take that second to close our eyes and to breathe deeply. Because now, maybe even just considering these ideas, whether you believe them or not, or, you know, do these exist, do these not exist, who knows, but I'm pretty sure that if you just sat for a moment in any overwhelming moment and had a few deep breaths, 
that you're going to feel more present, that you're going to feel more integrated, and that you're going to feel more capable to interact with life as yourself, whoever that self is. And we're kind of getting there. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Oh, we need to go. Okay. Well, the nice thing is, sorry, Julia, you, <laughs> and we need a few minutes for, for, for questions if there are any, but okay. So we're getting there. So hour and a half, right? I have five minutes. I have five minutes for two bodies and this is great. They're a little bit complicated bodies, but they're also actually easy bodies. So beyond the first three bodies, the fourth layer we have is called Vinyana Maya Kosha. And when you see it written, there's a J in there, and that is just how we translate the Sanskrit. So don't get too confused. But Vinyana Maya Kosha is defined as the psyche or the intellect. And I'm not going to go too deep into this because it is almost a pool in and of itself. But the reason I love arriving to this particular layer is that the intellect, sometimes we like to think of ourselves as intellectual people, right? Because the mind is functioning in a clear way. I'll tell you why that is in just a second. But mind and intellect are actually two separate bodies through which we are experiencing our existence and the intellect one of my favorite definitions or one of my favorite storytelling voices about what this idea of intellect is is really our intuition and our intuition is something that we know we have and everyone in this moment in time is going to have a slightly different relationship with it. But again, sort of like many of the examples I hope that are resonating with you on a, a slightly more real life level, who of us has never had the experience of being like, I shouldn't have done it. And I know I shouldn't have done it because my intuition told me I shouldn't have done it. But my mind made up all the reasons that I should do it and I did it and now I know I'm wrong. So the key as a yogi in this situation, of course, is to not judge ourselves, just to notice that we went with a story rather than going with something that perhaps was a little bit more wise and just moving forward, right, without attachment to what mistake we may have made. But this experience of intuition is an experience of what in yoga philosophy we begin to call universal wisdom. And here we start jumping into the very, very deep pool of even the story of creation and yoga philosophy, which clearly we don't have time for because I haven't even been able to do this within my time constraints. So I'm sorry about that, but we're going to do our best to clear it up. But when we get to the level of the intellect, what we're really getting to is the layer of us that is intimately connected to universal wisdom. And when we go back to that idea that maybe part of who we are is infinite and divine and completely true, I'm certain also that somewhere along the line, you've heard a voice making a connection to the fact that this part of you that is divine and infinite is actually what is the truth of all of life. And at the level of the intellect, we begin to be able to hear this universal wisdom that we often call our intuition. How do you know? I just know. How do you know? It's because it is the thing, the thought, the intention, or the action that directly resonates with the truth of life. That makes sense? And so what I want you to imagine, and this is really fun when we're people in a room, so I'm going to ask you to imagine it um, just in your minds really quickly because I think it's a nice way to tap into what is this. Okay, so now we've moved from Anamaya Kosha, the physical, for sure. We're cool that it exists. Pranamaya Kosha, I'm going to go with most of you were still hanging in there with me that it definitely exists. Mind, probably too. Now we're moving just like water from a block of ice toward its gassiest phase. Let's say steam that we can see in a cold room is like the mind. 
Now we're in a room with steam that we can no longer see. So this is the first layer that we're like, hmm, pretty sure it exists, but really starting to not be sure what it is, is Vinyana Maya Kosha. So what I want you to imagine is that you are the, let me get this right because now I'm thinking to do this fast. So you are you, yeah? And you are sitting in the middle of a circle and in that circle or around you in that circle, I hope that, that we can do this with our imaginations, is your physical body, is your pranic body, and is your mind, okay? And you, as we're starting to see at a more and more subtle level, are also comprised of an intellectual body that is tapping into universal wisdom, that is this idea of intuition. So you are sitting in the middle of the circle surrounded by your body, your mind, and your pranic body. And as we experience life on any given day, those things are constantly chattering, are they not? You always feel your body. You're always feeling your breath, your energy. You're always aware of it. And certainly you're always aware of your mind. So you are sitting in the middle of the circle and I want you to imagine like you're in a crazy party and all three of these other bodies are just talking to you all at the same time. All three of them have a really important story to tell you, but they're telling you in their highest voices all at the same time. Can you imagine this? All sides. Okay, now everyone gets quiet. Could you hear yourself think? Did you understand anything about what was said? And that's why on a day-to-day -day basis, from moment to moment, we don't feel so connected with our intuition. Because our intuition is vibrating at a frequency. It is more subtle than these other three bodies of our existence. And as we know, these other three bodies of our existence have a whole heck of a lot to say. And so Vinyana Maya Kosha, this poor, intimate, intellectual, tapping into the true source of wisdom layer of our perceivable existence, it's there, it's functioning, but it's really hard to hear. And so we go back again, just one more time to my Shavasana or walking in the woods example. Why do you have your most brilliant thoughts in Shavasana? Who hasn't ever had, you know, one of those? We've already talked about it. Why? Because the body is happy. The breath is happy. Thereby the mind is happy. And what we are hearing is our internal wisdom. That's always there. But because it vibrates at such a high frequency, because its subtlety is the greatest subtlety that we've encountered so far, it is difficult to perceive when the chatter is going on with the other three layers. And so again, it's quite beautiful because if we're edging our way to the fact that maybe our true nature actually is the divine and the infinite that actually is tapped into the universal wisdom. I've only asked you to walk through three layers of harmonizing before you can begin to tap into that wisdom. And so as Hatha yogis, again, we're really lucky and we're, we, we really have this phenomenal opportunity to continue cultivating from our physical body through these different bodies of our perceivable existence to begin to understand what is our true nature. And part of the guide toward what is our true nature is that when we harmonize those first three koshas, we begin to more easily perceive our intellect, our intuition, and that internal wisdom whose source is actually the universal wisdom. Does that make sense? Fourth layer, fifth layer, we made it almost to the end. The fifth layer is Ananda Maya Kosha, and this is often called the bliss body. And bliss is a really beautiful word, and I think it's a very purposeful 
helpful way to translate this. And that is because when you think about bliss, do you get a particular emotion? You do? Yeah, some of you, some of you may, but let me put it in contrast to, for example, love. When I say love, does the mind start moving a lot? When I say bliss, is it different? Maybe a little bit. It's just something to think about. But again, it's every one's manomaya kosha moves in a different way depending what the kaleidoscope of our reality is. And so, but but it's just something to consider. So bliss is getting even closer to the idea of universal understanding. And this is really the essence of what yoga is. It isn't being able to contort yourself. It isn't being able to hold your breath for five minutes. It isn't even being able to still the mind. It is being able to access the truth of how all of life is integrated and letting that be the origin of how all of these other bodies that are allowing us to perceive and interact in life with are inspired. Did that make sense? And so we kind of work from the most gross level and sometimes it's depicted as in. But what's really beautiful, even about that idea of going in, and they say most traditions, most philosophical traditions that come from the Vedas and the Upanishads say that this bliss body resides in the right side of the heart, which is really right in the center of the chest. This is where the part of us that is both infinite, but is also the tapestry from which we grow into the unique person that we are in this life is born. So in our mind, we perceive of it as going in, but what we're actually doing is expanding out. And this is where I'll leave you because I know I've gone a little bit over time, but this idea of the koshas, right, moving from the most gross to the most subtle ways that we experience life. In essence, all five of these bodies are changing entities in some way, which means that they aren't really our true self. And this is the point which you're peeling the onion that you really do cry because maybe you're thinking, okay, well, you just told me about all these five layers and still who am I? But who you are is the pure source through which all of these other things are manifested. Who you really are, and this is what yoga is offering to us to try on as an idea, is that which is animating these other five bodies to allow us to participate and experience life. And in some ways it's like, okay, hmm, I'm just gonna put that in my pocket and let the butterfly fly away and come back to it in five years. And in another way, there's something really gorgeous. Why? Because if I say to you in some ways, and I'm, I'm so sorry for yoga teachers who might be listening to this, but one thing that I don't love when, when we're sharing yoga is when we say, don't worry, we're all the same. I'm sorry, but I'm looking at the screen and I see we're not all the same, right? You see, we're not all the same, but we are. And this is the real beauty of life is that through the diversity, we have the opportunity to actually understand all that connects us in an infinite way. And it's actually through these five koshas, through these five bodies that each of us has that we are able to perceive of ideas that are imperceivable in life. And so while at some point we all sort of feel like, ah, oh, this body is so cumbersome, or oh, I can't remember to breathe, or I'm so short of breath and I don't know what to do, or oh, my mind is going crazy, I just want to invite you, if nothing else, to remember the fact that it is 
because you have these aspects of yourself that you are able to participate in life. And who is it that is participating in life? It is actually universal wisdom. The heart of you is wise. And that wisdom has this really unique, beautiful opportunity to interact with life through the unique tapestry of all of the different conglomerations of things that came together in vibration to make you who you are in this life. So who am I? I am this. Yes, I am. And who else am I? I am universal. I am divine. I am pure. And I know that's a huge leap to make in an hour and a half. And I know that some of you are going to be like, oh, okay, so that's just, again, this like yogic, oh, I'm divine, I'm pure, yeah, whatever, but I don't feel that. But hopefully, if on any subtle level, to use this beautiful word again, what you take away from today is a deeper understanding that you are comprised of many different things that allow you to experience life. And as yogis, part of our job, right, tapas, this deep determination is just to return again and again to the practice. And through that vehicle of the practice, it's no longer the words that I'm saying to you that become true or resonate with you or make some difference in your life. It is your own realization of the truth of it that will become. So I think probably <laughs> I've gone a little bit over time, even for questions and answers. I was thinking it would be a simple thing to do, but I get so excited. So um, forgive me, those of you who maybe had other appointments or hot dates. Um, but thank you, Julia, again, so much for inviting me in on this topic. And again, I hope at least one butterfly or maybe two landed on your shoulders. Many. And, good. So and anyway, probably we don't have time for questions, but if, if people have questions, I'm completely open to emails, um, to, to being contacted, to open conversations, because I, I really love to, to share these ideas and kaleidoscopes through which we're all navigating this really interesting thing called life. Definitely. And I think it's, since it was such a wonderful and just full lecture, I think it's good to kind of settle a little bit with all the thoughts uh, because yeah, it's a lot to think about, but it was really <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly. And yes, anyone who has question, either contact Molly right away or just send me the email with the questions and I will forward it. So I think, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much again. And I'm so much looking forward to your next one about Enadis. Yes, Wednesday. I will, I will practice being a little bit more timely, but it's also Wait. a slightly more simple subject. So Wonderful. Look forward to seeing everyone on Wednesday. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be with you all today.